recess until the vote is completed, and then we will return. But I'm going to introduce the panel and possibly get to at least one opening statement before we have to recess. Our first panelist on the third panel is Tracy Deneen Sharpley White. She's a PhD professor at Vanderbilt University. Professor Sharpley Whiting is the author of a book entitled Pimps Up, Holes Down, Hip Hop's Hold on Young Black Women, and she is a leading academic on, among other things, feminist and critical race theory. Our next panelist is Mr. Andre, or Andrew rather, Rojeki, who is also a Ph.D. and an associate professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. President, uh, professor Rojeki is the co-author of the book, The Black Image in the White Mind, and has researched how media portrayals of African Americans reinforce stereotypes in the minds of white Americans. Williams, also a PhD, is a chair of the National Congress of Black Women. Dr. Women, Dr. Williams, rather, is a valiant fighter, always on the front line. A remarkable woman. She continues the legacy of the former NCBW chairwoman the late Honorable Shirley Chisholm, and the late Honorable C. Dolores Tucker. She has targeted misogyny in hip-hop music as an area of much-needed reform. Lisa Fager is the president of Industry Ears. Ms. Fager is a leading watchdog of com commercial hip-hop and has long sought to reform hip-hop and return us to its artistic roots as an empowering art for art form for young people. And our last witness is Ms. Karen Deal, also a PhD. She's a professor at Lenore Ryan College. Professor Deal is a psychologist who specializes in gender stereotypes and misogyny as perpetrated and reinforced by the popular media. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask our first witness, Dr. Whiting, would you please uh, take five minutes for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stearns, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to provide testimony on this very important topic. It is a privilege to testify before the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Today, demeaning, degrading, and objectifying black women are undeniably profitable pastimes. From the cross-dressing male Manny Alexis and Eddie Murphy's recent turn into the $50 million generating Hollywood vehicle Norbit, to the Don Imus not beheaded hose Kerfuffle, to Rush Limbaugh's referring to the accuser in the Duke Lacrosse rape case as a hoe, to the We Don't Love Them hoes ethos of much of commercial hip hop. A culture of disrespect with black women on the receiving end, packaged as entertainment, permeates American popular culture. There are iPod commercials that allude to strip club culture featuring an abundantly rump black woman holding onto a pole on a public bus. And then there's the Quentin Tarantino ode to alpha females in the second film of the double feature Grindhouse, where the lone black female character is the only one to utter ad nauseum and expletives that describes a female dog. Indeed, such antics have risen to the level of art, whereby entertainers believe they should receive a free pass because they are merely performing their craft, whether it be crude, commercially shock jocks, or grill-wearing, pimped-out rap artists. Although most Americans associate this culture of disrespect with hip-hop culture, ironically, such characterizations find their roots in our nation's beginning. In 1781, a mere five years after pinning that hallowed document of a new nation, the Declaration of Independence, freedom while sanctioning perpetual bondage, our founding father Thomas Jefferson 
set his sights on writing on his beloved state of Virginia. In between pages on flora and fauna and notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson delivered a prophecy about race-based race -based slavery in the United States. Of slavery, he would write, it was a great political and moral evil, and that he trembled for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Deep-rooted prejudice entertained by whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, will divide us into parties, ending in the extermination of one or the other race. Of blacks in general, he concluded that, and I quote, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, they are inferior to the whites in the endowment both of body and mind. And of black women, he suggested that they were more ardent and preferred uniformly by the male orangutan over females of his own species. There were no orangutans to be found in Virginia to substantiate such an observation. This fact was of little consequence to Thomas Jefferson. A deeply complicated and consistent man, Jefferson, as is widely acknowledged, had a prolonged intimate relationship with the young slave girl, Sally Henry. With notes on the state of Virginia, our nation's third president sealed an odious racial sexual contract within our national fabric regarding black women. Jefferson's paradox has had an enduring legacy in the United States. Against this unequivocal founding doctrine, black women have continuously been struggling both in the courts of law and public opinion, in our very own communities, and as of late on America's airways. From slave narratives like Harriet Jacobs' incident in the life of a slave girl, to post-emancipation writing such as Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South by a Woman from the South, black women have been steadfast in declining attacks on their character and morality. When after the president of the Missouri Press Association wrote an open letter addressed to an English woman, attempting to cast aspersions on the credibility of anti-Lincoln crusader Ida B. Wells, he laid plain that black women had no sense of virtue and character. In response, the Black Women's Club was organized in July 1895 to send their name. Despite our strides in every area of American life, nearly two million college-educated black women out-earning their white and Latino counterparts, one in four of us occupies managerial or professional positions, the profits to be had at our expense are far greater than the cost of caricature, our personal needs. Our own complicity and our objectification requires some scrutiny as well. Consumer culture seduces many of us into selling ourselves short in the marketplace of ideas and desires. The range of our successes and the diversity of our lives and career paths have been concealed in the mainstream media and to video victims thanks to Kareem Stephan's best-selling confessions of the video victim, or shake dances given the frenzy surrounding the three great tape and hip-hop culture's collaboration with the multi-billion dollar adult entertainment industry. That sexism and misogyny appear to be working overtime in America's boxes into these very narrow depictions of black womanhood are part and parcel of the Jeffersonian contract. If our culture is certainly great in the muck of this race gender chauvinism. Male feelings of displacement in a perceived topsy-turvy female-dominated world, increased competition for women and girls in every facet of American life, contribute to black male on black female gender drive by. And black women seeming resilient despite America's continuing race and class gender bias, our strengths are flung back at us and condensed into cliches such as the late New York Senator Daniel Park, Patrick Moynihan's emasculating superwomen are better still, that he were. So America drinks to the bursting from that Jeffersonian well. It is imperative that women become more politically and socially conscious about the choices we make and the opportunities we take. As a writer and scholar and member of the so-called hip-hop generation, I find aspects of American popular culture with its global reach an entrepreneurial and innovative spirit deeply gratifying and simultaneously painfully disturbing. For it has become abundantly clear that not so much that we women don't count. We do, in obviously various insidious ways. But we also don't add up to much, certainly not more than the profits in the billions to be had at our expense. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to testify before this subcommittee today, and I look forward to answering questions, any questions you and others may have of me. We want to thank you. Uh, we have to recess to go to vote. A vote does occur on the floor, so uh, we'll recess until the conclusion of the last vote, and then we'll come back. I want to thank you so much.